Welcome back to the Our View podcast. On today's episode, I welcome my guests, Allie, Sarah, and Katina. Allie and Sarah are board certified behavior analysts, and Katina is a board certified assistant behavior analyst. Our conversation today is all about autism. I hope you gain some knowledge, some understanding, and awareness about autism through this conversation. Enjoy. Hey, I would like to welcome everyone back to another episode of the Our View podcast, where we aim to educate, raise awareness, and change the tone of conversation about disabilities. Today, our topic of conversation is autism. This episode will be out in May, but as all of you are aware, that April um, was Autism Acceptance Month. And uh, so I have three guests on today who I'm very happy to welcome to the podcast today. We have Katina, Sarah, and Allie, and um, on the show today, we're just going to have a a conversation about autism, what it means, um, and the role that you all have in your jobs um, working with uh, people who are on the autism spectrum. So uh, thank you all for joining me today. (laughs) Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So... um, can we start with uh, just introducing uh, yourselves um, and sharing uh, how you became interested in your in your field and uh, what your current job titles are and what you do in those roles? And um, I'll start with um, I'll start with Allie. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm Allie. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. Um, the acronym is BCBA, which we all tend to use more commonly. Um, I became interested in just the field of special education when I was in high school. We had to do a service project to graduate. I decided to do a six-month program with um, an elementary school kid who was diagnosed with autism, and I just kind of fell in love with the field there. So I went for my undergraduate to become a learning behavior specialist, and I worked as a special education teacher for just under seven years. And then I switched gears completely and started to work for the company called Autism on the Seas, helping families travel with kids with special needs. And that's kind of how me, Sarah, and Cantina all connected, actually. And then from there, it was actually Sarah who helped kind of guide me into the world of ABA and becoming getting my master's to become a BCBA, which um, I think I did, I became a VCBA in 2019. And then um, I've been doing in-home behavior therapy since as an analyst. And I more recently moved into the role of a senior behavior analyst. So I get to provide support to newer analysts and just analysts in the company to provide quality care for our clients. So it's kind of like combining ABA and teaching all in one. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, Katina, can you uh, share with us uh, who you are and what you do? (laughs) Sure. So I became interested in special education also in high school um, when I was working at a day camp. Um, I got, I formed a really strong bond with a girl, um, a camper who had cerebral palsy. Um, So that's how I initially became interested in special education. And then I kind of really honed in on autism specifically um, when I was in college. Um, I had a variety of different internships and different special ed settings. um, And I just really um, felt connected to the students with autism there and decided um, I I started to work at the Eden Institute in Princeton. That gave me like a lot more um, background and information. Um, And then after college, um, I've had lots of different um, teaching experiences. So I'm a special education teacher. Um, I've always been a, an autism teacher and I've taught grades K through nine actually throughout my 12 years of teaching. I've been kind of all over the place and I've been in different um, educational settings. I've taught in two different um, public school settings and also a private school that teaches just individuals on the spectrum. Um, and then like Allie mentioned, um, we all met through Autism on the Seas. 
And um, the three of us got even closer when we were studying for our board exams. So in addition to being a teacher, I'm also a board certified assistant behavior analyst, which is a BCABA. Cool. <laughs> and um, we'll round this out with Sarah. <laughs> yeah, um, mine is completely different from um, Allie and Katina. So my brother has autism. He is, um, he's 28. He was diagnosed when he was two and a half. Um, so his primary diagnosis is MR, and then he um, was diagnosed with CDD-NOS, so <clears throat> my entire life was going to <laughs> sibling support groups and um, just being around, going to horseback riding, just like IEP meetings, all of that stuff, so, so it's been my whole life. Um, I babysat for a lot of different kids with disabilities and um, autism, and then in college, I ended up, my work-study program was a, um, was on campus and it was four to eight students with autism and it was their alternative to high school. So they came on campus and they did um, <clears throat> they did uh, curriculum in the morning, but that was how to read the newspaper, um, how to do the Heimlich, things about living alone. And then in the afternoons they have jobs on campus and I absolutely loved it. I loved my job. Um, so I piled around with them for the four years that I was in college and then I, got my master's in clinical psychology and where I chose to get my master's, um, the university was affiliated with a um, student ran um, ABA clinic. So that's where I learned a lot of intensive teaching. Um, the, they had small programs. They had a feeding intensive pediatric feeding program. They had a early intervention program that was three hours long and they had a social skills program in the afternoons. And I took my time volunteering and getting my experiences in all those programs. Um, and then I decided to move to Maryland and um, I got a job working at an ABA clinic and had kind of decided uh, I, I was kind of avoiding being a BCBA because I knew what it was. And I was like, do I want to do this? No, no, no. I don't know if I want to do this, but I ended up here anyway. So I tell a lot of my supervisees, if you like this, just do it because you're going to save yourself a lot of time and money if you just do it. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, we all decided we were going to do this and study together. And then, yeah, we all became PCBAs in 2019. But I, um, I've been working at the same company for almost six years. And I just moved up as like an ABA therapist, um, a feeding therapist, uh, team coordinator role, BCBA, and now program coordinator. Great. Um, so you all brought up um, a common theme among the three of you, which is autism on the seas. I know a lot about it and I love it uh, so much, but can one of you explain a little bit more about what um, what autism on the seas is? It's really, uh, really a great thing. Allie. Yeah. Allie has to do it. <laughs> Allie's taking it. <laughs> um, okay, guys. <laughs> I, <got it. laughs> Um, I actually just got off, off a ship a week ago today. So yes, I am familiar. Uh, so Autism on the Seas helps families travel with kids with, well, not just kids, um, family members with a uh, disability. So we make the process pretty seamless as far as getting on the ship. We provide support from the moment you get in port to the moment you leave the day you get off the ship. And all of our staff, we call them staff, but they're actually volunteers. It's teachers, BCBAs, therapists, and other, other areas that volunteer their time to come on board with us. Um, Katina, Sarah, and I were all group leaders. So we're kind of the ones that help guide all the events throughout the week. Um, we do things like um, priority seating for all the shows so that the families don't have to get there extra early to get good seats and don't have to wait all that extra hustle is eliminated. Same with like all the venues the ship has. So a lot of the ships have uh, flow riders, which is that surfing simulator thing, um, water slides. What else y'all? Oh, ice, ice skating. skating. Uh, dating, wall, roller skating, I fly. Yeah, so all that stuff, we get private venue times to again, eliminate crowds, eliminate um, a lot of the extra sensory needs that might cause issues for a lot of our guests that are on board with us. And then we do things like have sections in the buffet that's just seating for our family. So again, you don't have to worry about 
waiting in line. We have staff available so families can leave their family member with us or they have an extra set of hands to get through the buffet. Just anything that we can do to help support the families um, to have an enjoyable vacation is what we do. Oh yeah, we also do respite. So we get an area, <laughs> we get an area on the ship where um, we put a bunch of sensory friendly materials. We get a lot of the activities that the ship has on board in the kids club. And then we bring them with our staff and the families get to drop siblings off too with us for a certain amount of time. So that then even the other family members have time to go enjoy the ship without worrying about the uh, daycare center calling because of behaviors or bathrooming or, you know, all those extra things that you don't always have to worry about when you vacation. Um, we're primarily on cruise ships, but we also do Disney World and uh, other resort days throughout the years too. Great. Thank you so much for um, sharing that. I, like I said, I think it's a very, uh, very cool thing because I, I have a physical disability and I know what challenges it can be, especially with, um, with traveling. Um, I was actually invited <laughs> to, a, to a Disney cruise last night with <laughs> some of my friends. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> considering it for uh, next year. Um, and and I checked out some videos about their accessible rooms and things like that. So things have gotten a lot better over the years as far as accessibility for mobility disabilities. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, they, they've come a long way. So um, it's great that you all have been a part of uh, such a great program that provides a very much uh, needed and important service to, um, to families who are traveling. And it, it gives everybody time to be together and, and you know, the child or the, the person with the disability doesn't have to stay home so mm -hmm. they can enjoy the uh, the trip as well. So that's uh, really cool. So thanks for uh, sharing that. I know that wasn't one of our planned questions, oh, but <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew somebody would be able to answer it. So. I know it would be Allie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so can one of you explain what is uh, autism, uh, autism spectrum disorder? Uh, you know, and I know there are different, um, different things that fall under that uh, umbrella. So can you, can one of you share or can all of you share a piece of what it is? Uh, so, um, so the DSM is kind of like ever changing, but the most current definition of autism, according to the most recent DSM, is persistent differences in communications, um, relationships, and um, just social interactions in general. Um, and then also, um, you know, the second part of that is restricted um, and repetitive behaviors and or interests. So um, repetitive behaviors can be like body movements or something called echolalia, where you um, repeat yourself or repeat phrases. Um, and then the limited interest is kind of what people I think more so think of when they think of autism. Um, you know, people that really hone in on trains and love trains and things like that. That's kind of like the autism that you see in the movies and things like that. Um, but, you know, the major thing that people think of when they think of autism is kind of those social differences. And then, <clears throat> so Katina, so the, the DSM changed in 2013. So the way it used to be was it was under this umbrella of autistic disorders and it had child disintegrative disorder, Rett's disorder, PDD-NOS, um, autistic disorder. So uh, it, it shifted in 2013 to just autism. Oh, Asperger's. Asperger's used to be under the umbrella and those don't, they don't, they're not in the DSM anymore. Um, and now it's a level system. So you have level one, two, or three. Um, and that is based off of how intensive your needs are. Um, and that is usually by a developmental pediatrician or um, just a pediatrician. Ali, I don't know who you who in your reports and things typically diagnosed because you have, but that's primarily who. MDs, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And I also, um, going along with what both of them have said too, is the challenging thing with an autism diagnosis is that it is a range and severity is objective, I think, in my opinion. So even as Sarah's talking about the levels of autism, what looks like a severity level and what 
may look like more severe autism doesn't mean that somebody with a less severe case of autism might not have the same number of challenges that the other individual does. So it gets really complicated when you're really talking about the diagnosis because there's no clear cut version of what autism look like, what it looks like and who represents autism because just because one person's right. interested in trains doesn't mean the next person you meet is going to be interested in trains or vice versa or have any type of interest in the same thing. So uh, one of my favorite sayings is if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism uh -huh. <laughs> because everybody is so unique and completely different. And it really is such a wide range. So you can't make any assumptions or judgments based off of one person um, and what their interests are and what their abilities are um, because everybody is just completely unique. Yeah, that is, um, that it's, it's so interesting that so many, um, you know, it's, it's with a lot of disabilities that happens. It's, mm -hmm. I have spina bifida and I, you know, I walk with braces and crutches and it's like, oh, well, I thought people with spina bifida can't walk. And it's like, well, some people can, I can't walk far. Don't ask me to, you know, mm -hmm. walk five miles or anything like that, but I can, you know, I can walk short distances. So, um, you know, so I, I love that quote with, uh, if you met one person, you've mm -hmm. met one person, that's like, that's it. And that's mm -hmm. their, <laughs> you know, that's their, mm -hmm. their diagnosis and their, uh, you know, the things that they're dealing with in their life. And it, it may be similar to somebody else, but you know, nothing, no two people are exactly the same. So that's really, uh, really great and important to point out. Uh, to get into a little bit of the statistics, I know it's a tricky <laughs> uh, answer sometimes because the numbers always change or they seem to change and depending on where, what you read and where you read it. Uh, but are there uh, any current or more recent statistics that you can share about uh, how many people uh, are living with uh, autism? The CDC just came out with an article about this topic. Um, and they're saying now that in the US, it's one in 44, um, which is interesting, um, you know, because when I went to college way back when, <laughs> The numbers were vastly different. Um, I was not in college in the year 2000, but for example, in the year 2000, it was one in 150. Mm -hmm. um, so the prevalence is definitely changing for sure. And then this is even more interesting. Um, we're in the state of New Jersey and in New Jersey, the prevalence is one in 35. Wow. So we're uh -huh. the second highest in the US. Um, California has the the highest prevalence and i actually i'm not sure exactly what it was but um new jersey is number two i read an article recently um that was discussing the influence the pandemic has had on um, diagnosing children because typically when kids you know they go to preschool or they you know start to go to school or that you know they just start spending time around other children that's when teachers and, and other caregivers kind of notify parents, hey, they're, there's like, they're not up to, you know, part with their peers, um, we see some delays, but, um, and I'm seeing it a lot in the children that um, come into my clinic, they, they're getting diagnosed later and later because the, the parents have had them at home, they might have siblings, but they, you know, they just kind of are limited with their social interactions. And, and just now they're finding out that their children have autism, but, you know, they're four years old. Yeah. Yeah, I know um, the pandemic has really uh, impacted a lot of uh, a lot of services, access to services that uh, children would typically have if they were in school and, uh, you know, not not having those available has, uh, you know, has definitely been, uh, you know, harmful and, and getting later diagnosis uh, for them for different uh, different diagnosis. So, uh, wow. Sarah, um, you'll have to send me that because that sounds interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I usually read the news as I fall asleep, so I'll have to go back and try to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to wrap up our conversation, can each of you share um, some resources that uh, our listeners can uh, go to either websites, books, movies, 
um, anything that uh, that you feel are a good uh, accurate or educational representations for uh, finding uh, information about autism. I I would suggest to go right to the the guys that we um, whose literature we look up to and we study. Um, a lot of them, even just on their websites. I mean, they've been behavior analysts for years, but um, Greg Hanley has a lot of stuff even on his website as far as sleep helping parents. Um, you know, you don't even, he has a, has a sleep clinic, but um, you don't have to, you know, you can just go to his website and there's a lot of free resources. Vincent Carbone is another one. Um, he, his main focus is language. Um, another one, Pat McGreevy, he wrote The Essentials for Living and he focuses on a lot of what are some very basic skills that you need in your life um, in order to be safe. Do you know how to, if, if you're holding a knife and I say your name, will you put it down? Just things that, you know, we don't always think of. Um, I don't know what you guys suggest. That's what I say. I, I would, oh, go ahead, Katina. <laughs> um, I was going to say reading um, literature written by people with autism. Um, so for example, there's a book, um, it's called The Reason I Jump, and it was written by um, an individual with autism and he was 13 years old at the time that he wrote it um, but it's just kind of like a Q and I so it kind of like you can get into his brain a little bit and again you know I brought up the quote you meet one person with autism that's one person with autism so of course his experiences don't reflect every person with autism but it is kind of interesting to get into his brain a little bit um, especially because most people saw him as nonverbal, but um, his written language is amazing um, there's also um, an individual with autism named Dr. Carrie Magro, who I had um, the opportunity to cruise with before. Um, he is in New Jersey, actually, he's New Jersey based. Um, he was diagnosed with autism, I think at age four. Um, and now he has his doctorate. Um, so he has a few books written and his most recent book came out earlier this month. It's called Autistics on Autism. So that's my current read. Um, and it's just tons of different stories of um, adults on the spectrum, what their experiences are, where they're at now. Um, and then of course there's Instagram <laughs> where I learn a lot of things from, but um, if you follow the hashtag actually autistic, um, you get a lot of information from um, you know voices of people with autism. Yeah, I definitely piggyback off of what Katina says. I think it's super important for autistic voices to be heard. So any opportunity that you have to um, get your hands on any of that material, whether it's Instagram, Facebook groups, whatever, and to just learn about other people's experiences and taking the time to reflect on maybe some of the challenges that they've experienced and even just what they're trying to say as far as what the world is like around them and maybe what are some things that we can do to help make the world a little bit more accepting for them I think is super super important so I definitely agree with Katina any of those groups I mean you're definitely going to hear polarizing opinions on basically any topic but it's super important to expose yourself to all those opinions to really get an idea of what the world is like with autism and you know none of us can say what it's like being autistic so I think it's important to get those views in regardless of how we feel about anything <laughs> just to hear it um clinically I'm reading Beyond Behaviors right now by Mona Delahook and I really really like it it's using behavior science and compassion to understand behaviors so it takes a lot of the science out of what we're doing right now to really understand behaviors. Um, and then just for fun, uh, things like Love on the Spectrum on Netflix is just such a great- yeah. That's what great I was just thinking. Culture. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, think, I think we need more of that in our everyday life, so. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. Like if you're more of a visual person, Love on the Spectrum is was like so great to watch. Um, mm -hmm. Also a while back, um, there was a movie about Temple Grandin and I think it, it was just mm -hmm. called Temple Grandin on HBO. I think that that was like, um, that was kind of a big deal for me to watch as a teacher early on in, in my career. Um, 
And then this isn't, this is, you know, a, a fictional show, but I loved the show Atypical mm-hmm. on Netflix, um, yeah. which features a boy named Sam who has autism. And, you know, it's not based on, I'm, I'm not sure if it's, you know, based on an actual person with autism or not, or, or if anybody did any consulting with the, the crew that, that made the show, but um, I enjoyed watching it as, as an autism feature. I guess the, the good doctor too, I think he's supposed to have autism in the show. Yeah. I don't watch it, but people really- I haven't watched it. it either. Yeah, that's, um, thank you for all of those great suggestions. Um, it's, it is, it's very important that, um, you know, the voices of those who actually live with the diagnosis are heard. So I'm glad that you, uh, you know, that you brought up uh, some of those uh, people, um, you know, who have written books or, or have active uh, social media accounts and things like that. And um, it's really, it's, it's just important, again, to have these conversations. And um, as I mentioned, like my goal in hosting these podcast episodes is to raise awareness and educate about different diagnoses. And, um, you know, a lot of my uh, episodes have people that live with certain disabilities. And then, um, people who work with those who have certain disabilities, it's important to hear from you all as well, uh, because you have a very uh, hands-on and, and front row seat to uh, to these diagnoses and, and to what the um, your students and your uh, people you work with, what they're uh, living with. So thank you for your time. I appreciate you all. Katina, thank you for um, organizing this and making it happen. <laughs> yeah, thank you yeah. for bringing it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks for having yeah. us. Yes. And um, so you all have a a good rest of your evening. (laughs) Thanks for tuning into today's episode. I want to make sure that this podcast is as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions or any topics you would like for me to address in an upcoming episode, be sure to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube at Our View for Life. That's O-U-R-V-I-E-W, the number four, L-I-F-B. You can also email me, ourviewforlife at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.